For those of you who may only have recently joined us, or those of you who watch us faithfully, but need a reminder of what's gone on before, we're doing a series of recaps, now every three months, so you can get a general idea of what you've recently missed or forgotten. And this is one of them. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War recap special covering the months of August, September, and October 1915. August began with a great deal of chaos. On the Eastern Front, the Russians had been in full retreat throughout the summer from the German war machine, and were even evacuating Warsaw and Riga. In the West, the Germans had just introduced flamethrowers, but the stalemate continued as it had for nearly a year. Italy was on the move, trying for a second time to break the Austrian defenses at the Isonzo River. In Anatolia, the Armenian genocide continued. Way down south, South Africa annexed German Southwest Africa, and at sea, the German campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare sent tons of civilian ships to a watery grave. It wasn't just flamethrowers that the Germans introduced. From the beginning of August began the Fokker Scourge, as German synchronization gear gave Germany, for many months, mastery of the skies. Now this was gear that allowed the pilot to fire his machine gun between the propellers so he could aim the gun just by aiming the plane. And it ushered in the era of the flying ace. Although the first flying ace, someone who shot down five or more enemy planes, was Frenchman Adolphe Pegoud. Pegoud would die August 31st when he himself was shot down. Though on the ground, the stalemate in the West continued throughout August without any major engagements, on the Eastern Front it was very much in motion. Warsaw fell to the Germans on August 5th, after a century of Russian control. And as the month rolled on, so did the Germans, taking Ivangorod, Kovno, Brest-Litovsk, Bialystok, and Grodno Fortress. By the end of the month, the Germans had set their sights on Vilna in Lithuania and Dvinsk, the gateway to Moscow and Petrograd. In total, on all of its fronts, 1.5 million Russian soldiers had by now been taken prisoner in just one year of war. Further south, the battle at Gallipoli had been a stalemate for months, but the Allies were really trying. One of the biggest and most bloody offensives of the whole campaign was the landings and advance from Suvla Bay, where for a couple of days, New Zealander forces had even managed to take the heights at Chunuk Bayir, from where they could see the straits below them. They were driven off by Mustafa Kemal and his Turkish forces. Toward the end of the month, the Allies would try and fail again, this time at Scimitar Hill. By this time, though, the Allied troops were also being decimated by disease, with hundreds of sick troops being evacuated every day, and there would be no more large offensives. The Italian battle at the Isonzo River would end mid-month with a tactical Italian victory, but no real gain of ground, and a loss of 40-something thousand men on each side. And September came on, and the heat of the summer faded. The German advance in the east continued for most of September, taking Vilna mid-month and indeed driving the Russians out of Poland and Galicia. But by the end of the month, as the ground turned to mud, the shrinking Russian front line allowed the Russians to reinforce and improve their defenses, and the German advance was finally halted. But the Russian army, now under personal command of the Tsar, was no longer an immediate threat to the Germans, who could focus more on the Western Front. And it was indeed dire times for Russia. The summer Austro-German offensives had created nearly a million and a half casualties over a few months, and Russia's industrial and agricultural output was certainly hurt by the loss of Poland. Social unrest at home grew and grew. The Western Front exploded into action late in the month as the British and French launched offensives at Luz, Artois, and Champagne. The British would deploy poison gas for the first time, and though they would, for a time, take their objectives, the stupidity of their leaders in still failing to recognize the effectiveness of German machine guns caused devastating British casualties. British commander John French would, partly as a result of the carnage at Luce, lose his position and be replaced by Sir Douglas Haig. The French, whose offensive sent in greater numbers of troops and lasted until November, would see greater casualties and would be unable to dislodge the Germans from their positions more than temporarily. The Germans finally announced the end of unrestricted submarine warfare, partly because of increasing American protests following American civilian deaths, and many U-boats would subsequently be sent to the Mediterranean to wreak havoc there. 
In the Middle East, the British advance on Baghdad continued as, at the end of September, Charles Townsend's forces took Kut al Amara. They set their sights on Tessifon and continued marching upriver. On September 6th, Bulgaria made a deal to join the Central Powers in order to gain land at Serbia's expense. The Austro-Hungarian, German, and Bulgarian invasions of Serbia would come in early October, along with the formal Bulgarian declaration of war. Serbia had held off Austro-Hungarian invasions three times so far this war, but they are so greatly outnumbered and outgunned this time that the end of Serbia is pretty much a foregone conclusion. Belgrade fell almost immediately, and throughout the month of October, the invaders advanced. French troops landed at Salonika and headed north to help the Serbs, but they too were woefully outnumbered. Still, the French and Serbian troops bravely mounted defenses throughout October. A lot of the October action was in the south, as in addition to the Serbian invasion, Italy tried once again at the Isonzo River. The battle was still in full force as the month ended, with both sides taking terrible casualties and the Italians unable to take much ground. At Gallipoli, the stalemate continued, though by this time, the new commander, Charles Monroe, and his superior at home, Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, were seriously considering evacuating the men. And so the autumn dragged on, and fall began to turn to winter. And at the beginning of November, here's what we see. The French offensives still grinding out bodies in Artois and Champagne. The Germans still trying and failing to advance toward Riga and Dvinsk as the land turns to impenetrable mud. The Russians harassing the Austrians further south. The Italians trying again and again at the Isonzo River. The Serbs and French up against gargantuan odds in Serbia as the Serbian civilian population flees toward the mountains of Albania. More depression and sickness at Gallipoli and a British army with no prospect of reinforcement marching up the Tigris River toward Baghdad. To see all of this and much more in detail, check out our regular weekly episodes from those three months. But I can sum it up a lot more tightly than I just did. The war grows bigger. More countries enter. New offensives break out all the time, all over the world. The weapons get more and more terrible and the killing becomes ever more anonymous and millions of men die without ever really knowing why. If you also want to refresh your memory of the first year of the war, you can check out our other two recap episodes in the playlist right here. You can always stay up to date with news about our channel or World War I in general on Facebook or Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe. See you Thursdays.